Well, hello, and thank you for joining us for our webinar, Experience as Your Differentiator, How to Attract and Retain Patients. I'm Adam Rubenfire, a content manager at Freesia, and I'll be introducing today's presentation. Today, we'll share how your healthcare organization's digital front door can not only support key functions like intake, access, and payments, but also enable an experience that builds patient loyalty and trust. And I'm excited to share how Mercy One is designing experiences that increase volume and engage patients to take an active role in their care. We're so happy to have Rob here, and I'll introduce him in just a bit. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly share some housekeeping notes. You can submit questions at any time using the Q&A widget at the top left-hand corner of your screen, and we'll ask as many questions as time, as we, as time allows. Uh, in the resource widget on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll find a one-page overview of Freesia, another one-pager about the digital front door, and a one-pager, excuse me, a white paper on how you can improve visit rates and encourage patients to seek preventive care. If you have technical difficulties, uh, as we hope you don't, but if you do, please click on the help widget. It has a question mark icon and covers common issues. And since it's always one of the most frequently asked questions, this session's being recorded and you'll receive a recording by the end of the week. Our session today will start with a quick introduction of our guest and Freesia. Then we'll define the digital front door and patients' expectations for their digital experience. Finally, we'll discuss Mercy One's digital front door best practices and conclude our webinar with Q&A. To start, I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker for today. Rob Gavora is the Interim Vice President of Mercy One Women and Children's Hospital at Mercy One Des Moines Medical Center in Des Moines, Iowa. And I just wanna share this amazing excerpt from his bio because it's so relevant to what we're talking about today. A collaborator, innovator, and servant leader, Rob has worked in a variety of administrative and business roles within Mercy One and was instrumental in the organization adopting Freesia as its preferred online scheduling and digital payment platform. Thanks, Rob. The son of a primary care physician, Rob keeps the patient experience at the forefront of his work and understands how making the communication and care process easy for patients leads to patient retention and brand loyalty. In a world where the average adult retention span is eight seconds, Having an easy registration and payment process for outpatient visits is critical to being competitive and becoming the provider of choice for patients. Rob, thank you so much for joining us today. I love that last line. Awesome. Well, um, thank you so much, Adam, and thanks to everyone at Freezer for making this um, come to life. Just real quickly with my background, as Adam said, my name is Rob Gabora. I've worked at Mercy One here in Des Moines, Iowa for just shy of about seven and a half years. I've been with our Women and Children's Hospital for just over a year. And as my bio said, I've worked in a variety of business, administrative, finance type roles. Um, it was at the forefront of our work a couple of years ago to help bring Freesia to the organization and really improve our digital registration, online scheduling, and just overall kind of digital platform and process. So again, super happy to be here. Um, look forward to answering your questions and maybe sharing a little bit about our story um, with Freesia and digital payments and processes at Mercy One. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. Uh, and I think I've on a lot of these webinars, but if you don't know me already, my name is Adam Ribbonfire. I'm a content manager here. I oversee editorial strategy for our events and webinars. I'm thrilled to work with Rob today to present some best practices and moderate the Q&A. And we'll get started. So just real quick, a few brief words about Freesia, and then I promise the rest of this presentation is really high level about that digital front door. Uh, but uh, Freesia is a SaaS technology company we're guided by our mission of creating a better, more engaging healthcare experience for patients, providers, and staff. We have real-time integration with all the leading EHRs and registration, scheduling, and billing systems. We're a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange. We've been na named the top-ranked patient intake company by the Research and Insights Firm class for four years in a row, and our security and privacy efforts are recognized with the industry's top certifications. If you're interested in learning more about Freesia, you can request a consultation using the drop-down on the right-hand side of your screen or visit freesia.com. Now I'm thrilled to kick us off with an overview of trends as it relates to the, to the digital front door, patient acquisition and patient retention. All right, let's start by defining the digital front door. Your digital front door is made up of the technologies that facilitate the patient journey before, during and after care. Uh, that could be everything from scheduling to registration and payments to post visit surveys and educational outreach. There's all kinds of things that can go into what makes up your strategy. Um, but for your digital front door to produce real operational, financial, and clinical results for your organization, 
all these pieces have to work together, right? All your technologies need to integrate with each other and with your EHR. And that entire process has to look seamless to the patient. They shouldn't have to keep multiple logins or download multiple apps. In fact, they shouldn't have to keep any logins or download any apps. They should be able to cl just click a link. Uh, it should be seamless for them. And, you know, at the start of that digital front door is patient access and registration. First impressions are everything. Most patients' initial interaction with your organization is scheduling a registration. Uh, making these tasks, they're just an essential part of that digital front door strategy. So at this stage of the patient journey, we have to make it easy for patients to do what we want them to do, schedule appointments, and then what we need them to do so that your organization can get paid. So that's providing their information so that claims can be submitted completely and accurately and paying any balances they're responsible for upfront. This experience can have a major impact on whether patients show up for their visit. Uh, when patients have checked in, our data shows they're more likely to be on time and prepared for their visit, reducing no-shows. And your digital front door can also be used to activate patients for their health by deploying targeted outreach for preventive care and administering screening tools for patient reported outcomes, PROs, and social determinants of health, SDOH, during the registration process so you can quickly connect them with the resources that support whole person care. I just want to share a few findings from a survey of 4,000 patients that we conducted last March. Um, it helps, I think, offer insights into what patients expect from your digital front door. We found that overall, nearly nine in 10 patients, uh, the overwhelming majority are comfortable using technology for their healthcare needs. That level of comfort extends to digital messaging with their doctor, online booking, and rescheduling appointments. 80 to 90% of patients said they'd use these tools in 2022 if they were available. About two in five patients paid their medical bills online in the past 12 months, but many more, 70%, said they'd do so if available through their doctor's office. We found that for many patients, some of these tools are must-haves, and we'll talk about what that means and how you should respond to that. And in case you're wondering, these preferences apply to older adults as well. More than half of patients aged 65 and older, 53%, said they checked in for a healthcare appointment online in the past year. 68% of those patients said they used a mobile phone to do so. 67% said they'd like to schedule or reschedule appointments online if given the option, and 52% of these older adults said they'd likely pay their medical bills online if given the option. Now, quickly, you know, it takes a lot for patients to say a tool is a must-have. It means they won't see a doctor who doesn't offer it. If your organization doesn't have these tools, you risk losing patients to someone who does. What we found is that many of the tools we're discussing are in fact must-haves for patients. 41% said they need to be able to email or text their doctor, 36% said they want to be able to manage appointment scheduling online, 29% said they need to be able to check in for appointments online, and 22% must have the ability to make payments digitally. So when we talk about consumer expectations for that digital patient experience, these tools are at the core of what you need to be delivering on. Now, one of the reasons you want to have an exceptional digital experience is to ensure you're staying competitive, especially with industry disruptors. Convenient care, direct-to-consumer virtual care, and membership models, are they're capturing a lot of patients in your service area. I don't need to give you brand names. You know who these, these folks are. And they're doing that because they're offering an exceptional digital first experience that is convenient, flexible, and meets patient expectations for the many service-based industries that patients interact with outside of healthcare every day. Uh, if you want to remain competitive, you have to bring the same or better resources to bear. But it's not just about other companies. You're also simply competing for patients' attention. It's not a given that patients are going to feel obligated to seek care for non-emergent needs. Some patients are unengaged. They don't think they need to keep up to date with preventive care. It's a, in a survey we conducted at the start of last year, about one in six patients told us they didn't plan to seek care in 2022. Um, but they might have sought care if they were engaged by their provider. 17% said so they weren't planning on seeking preventive services because their provider hadn't recommended it. Some patients have low health literacy. They don't understand the healthcare system or what they need to do take care, to take care of their health. And some may have low literacy in general or not speak English. And some patients distrust the health system. Uh, they might not hold a stigma against talking to clinicians about their physical or mental health. For all of these patients, it's on us to build a digital front door that is accessible, that builds trust, and educates them about their health. But most importantly, as I've said, we have to make it easy for them to make the right decisions for their health. Now, just one more slide before I hand it over to Rob to talk a little bit about Mercy One. I don't want to spend too much time talking about Gen Z because I know our audience serves 
patient populations of all ages. But I do think it's important to understand their preferences and concerns with the current state of the healthcare system so we can think about how to acquire them as patients now and retain them for their entire lifespan and all the life cycle events that come with that. As you can see from this data from Accenture, Gen Z, that orange line on that graph, is largely dissatisfied with the traditional healthcare system. More than any other age group surveyed, they top every category. Uh, they're most upset with quality, but relevant to this presentation, they're very unhappy about the convenience of care, with 24% expressing dissatisfaction. We really have to probe Gen Z's concerns with the convenience of care and find ways to meet them, especially if your healthcare organization is under a value-based or ACO care model. You know, if you can acquire those patients when they're young and healthy and retain them by keeping up with their preferences, we're going to have a much lower acquisition cost, or we're going to build, we're going to experience the financial benefits of having them as a long-term patient, especially if they build a family and that family comes into your healthcare system. So Rob, I want to hand it to you. Can you talk to us uh, about Mercy One and your reach and kind of some of the results you've seen with your digital front door? Yes, absolutely. Thanks so much, Adam. And um, just one comment as I'm reflecting on that, that previous slide as well, you know, that's of course our kind of status quo where we currently sit in terms of different generations and their engagement with digital healthcare. I think as we all know, that's only going to continue to shift um, for the future, right? So a lot of our work, and we'll talk about some of this today, is based on our current status quo, but also where we think healthcare is going and our consumers want us to go. And so um, I just want to keep that at the forefront of what we're talking about, because I think the future is going to obviously dictate a lot of what we do today and kind of how we best plan um, for what's to come. But without further ado, the map you all can see on your screen here is a really good, I think, geographical footprint and, and sort of picture of us as Mercy One. So just a couple of quick kind of background points as well on our organization and kind of how we're structured. Um, previously, Mercy One, we were part of a joint operating agreement between formerly Catholic Health Initiatives, now Common Spirit Health, and then Trinity Health, two large national Catholic health systems, um, and all of the assets, mo most of which you see on the screen here today, um, were part of that joint operating agreement. Um, more recently, as of a few months ago, we are actually all now part of Trinity Health. So all of the owned assets, Mercy One Des Moines Medical Center, Mason City, and so on, are now part of Trinity Health going forward. So we are all one wholly owned entity under one large national parent organization, um, which is very exciting news for us and for our patients, hopefully going forward. Um, real quickly here again, you can see our markets across the state. We have a pretty large geographic footprint across Iowa. As you can see as well, I have a few markets, Mercy One in Siouxland in Western Iowa, Dubuque and Clinton, the Eastern portion of the state, that also bleed into Illinois, Wisconsin, and then Nebraska as well in that Western portion. Um, as you can see, we have over 42 medical centers, I think 44 today. They're either owned by Trinity Health or affiliated with Mercy One through a management agreement. And we also have, of course, all of our clinics and ambulatory care sites, which we'll really talk about today in terms of the digital front door and our work with Freesia. And we have over 230, I think almost 250 now, um, clinics across Iowa. So again, super happy to be here. And this is a little bit about um, our organization. So our digital transformation and kind of our, our front door. So you all can see the stats on the screen here. I won't go through them each individually. Um, I'm gonna more so maybe talk high level about our journey and our path and kind of how we got to where we're at today. Um, you know, prior to our organization getting in touch with Freesia, probably at least four or five years ago um, from now, um, we really did not have much in terms of digital online capabilities for patients to schedule appointments, to check in for set appointments, and to make digital payments in terms of their copay or outstanding balances for their appointments as well. And some of the work we had done through whether it's patient focus groups or other types of communication, our patients really voiced to us, you know, it's not that they didn't want to pay for their services, it's not that they couldn't access certain things, but if we had digital processes and things that they could utilize to better from their iPad, from their iPhone, from any type of digital um, or smart device, get in touch with our organization, they would not only be much more engaged in their care, but they would also be, again, following up on appointments, um, paying their balances or things at the time of service versus us kind of chasing payments in arrears, and would just overall be much more engaged with their relationship with our organization. I think the word relationship is one that I do want to harp on today and we'll probably you know mention a few more times because at the I think crux of all this work, as Adam alluded to earlier, is really engaging the patient and developing and fostering that relationship with them throughout their healthcare journey. Whenever that starts with our organization, it could be from the time that they're a child or a baby um, all the way through you know the, the end of their life. And so we really want to make sure that our patients not only stay engaged, but feel again if they need something that they can easily access that. 
um, within our organization. And so I think that's what I'll, I'll cover on this slide. You can see, again see the stats here, but um, we've had great success with our, our work with Freesia. And again, I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that as we kind of move across um, the presentation. Um, so again, this is a great example, I think, in the success we've had with our mammogram program um, and kind of how we've been able to develop um, a really good, secure, I think, process to get those patients not only registered, but also scheduled for appointments as well. Um, I, I think, again, as we go throughout the presentation today, it's very important to note the registration process and the scheduling process, although they kind of work hand in hand or are tied together, um, many patients do view those as two discrete processes, which I think is important, right? Because from the point of I'm a patient, I need something, I need to be scheduled, obviously, for something that's not a walk-in urgent care type of visit. How do I access that appointment? And I think when we started talking about this work, you know, at our forefront, you know, four or five years ago, we did a lot of process mapping and really um, understanding of where a patient sits today and the number of steps it takes to get to that endpoint of scheduling themselves for a visit registering for a visit, whatever it may be, and really trying to minimize um, those number of steps in between those two endpoints as much as possible. Because the more clicks, the more apps, or the more, as Adam alluded to earlier, steps the patient is going to have to take to get to that endpoint, the less likely they really are to be engaged with the organization, with the process. And again, namely develop a relationship where they are really a trusted user and really think about your organization or you as a provider of choice for them first when they need something. So you can see kind of the stats on um, the screen here. Again, many of our patients that have a mammogram or are eligible for mammogram um, may utilize the digital registration process. And just some of the success you can see on the screen we've had here with, um, with Freesia. Imaging was a real area we kind of honed in on from the forefront of our work um, with an area that really had identified gap of patients needing to be scheduled and, and feeling again that the process we had in place, whether it was calling over the phone or, or working from their physician's office to get something scheduled was, was just very laborious. Um, a lot of, I think, opportunity for communication. Patients sometimes feeling they were left in the dark about, am I scheduled, am I not? If so, when's that gonna be? And we, again, really try to eliminate all that questioning or just not you know unawareness um, by having something that patients could own themselves, but in a positive way own digitally and take moments to complete versus multiple phone calls, multiple handoffs, things of that nature, so. Excellent, Rob, thanks so much for sharing all of that. Uh, I'm thrilled to talk to you more about this digital transformation and what you've been able to achieve. Uh, audience, if you have questions, continue to send them in. We'll get to as many questions as we have time for. And if we didn't get, don't get to them uh, today, uh, we'll make sure to follow up with you and, and make sure you get your questions answered because I think what is so fascinating about this topic uh, Rob, is just how, you know, kind of varied um, digital front door strategies can be, how really it's about figuring out what sticks for your po po patient population. Because when we talk about competitive landscape, when we talk about, um, you know, um, just the dynamics of, of what gets patients in your market, uh, we'll use the word stick, uh, you know, later kind of, I, I want to talk to you a little bit, but, but what gets patients to, to be loyal and to retain them, um, it can be different for everyone. So Rob, I think you've talked about this a little bit, but I want to just know if there's anything else you want to share about what your digital front door strategy looks like today. How do patients interact with your health system digitally? Um, and, and, and kind of how have you decided that that's, you know, what you want to, your, the experience to be? Yeah, Absolutely. Um, so I think, again, for us, we start with the patient, right, where a patient sits um, physically, mentally, emotionally, and, and maybe try to predict, again, not only what they need, but how they're going to get it, right? And so um, we do, of course, today, as many health systems have all the traditional methodologies of getting in touch with us via phone, et cetera. Um, but really, as we're looking again at, you know, our current population, the future of where it's going, how can we best align ourselves with the consumer demand and need in a day and age when, you know, Amazon, other organizations, I mean, within two clicks, you can buy something. Um, how can we stay competitive in that environment? Again, not saying that we're directly competing with, um, you know, non-traditional entities, although, you know, I think we are to a certain degree, um, kind of where does it start and stop for us? And so we wanted to think about this in the sense of if I'm a patient and I can go online to Google to any search engine and type in Mercy One, how quickly can I make an appointment or at least have a developed next step of what I need and how I'm going to get there. And so today you can go to, again, our website, mercyone.org, but even at the most simplest step via Google, again, or any search engine, search for our organization, 
search geographically by where you physically are located and what maybe services you might want to utilize or via telehealth, whatever your, um, your needs might be, and then figure out very quickly how you can make an appointment, again, all digitally um, with one of our providers, whether it's a primary care physician, um, reserve your spot in line for urgent care, things of that nature that we're still developing, but even how can you quickly get to where I'm at today, where I need, and minimize everything in between so that's a seamless digital, entirely digital process. Um, and it's, it's taken a lot of work to get there. You know, the one other comment I would make on that is um, you think about online scheduling and how a patient gets to that point is selecting providers and locations and clinics and things like that. Your templates on the provider side, things of that nature. I mean, we had to go all the way down to the from the patient level, of course, on the consumer side, but to the provider, you know, on our end as well, and their staff and their team, um, to make sure that we were all clearly aligned so that patients aren't getting different experiences, even just digitally in terms of scheduling things with a certain clinic here or, or a provider there. And so um, not to say that it wasn't a lot of back end work to get to where we're at today, but um, I think we've definitely reaped the benefit of having a very seamless, easy process and hopefully setting the standard, or at least being part of the standard in our community for how patients view um, their healthcare providers as being very accessible and very easy to, um, to get a hold of and, and to get care from. You mentioned templates. I, I think people get wrapped up in technology and forget that messaging needs to be like on the same too. So that's, that's fantastic. You know, Rob, you mentioned being a leader, uh, you know, in your community, and I'm sure, uh, I, I know Mercy One is, um, and you, we talked about like disruptors. How, one of the questions I think we get a lot, how do you think about competition? How do you evaluate your digital experience versus the competition? What tips do you have for folks on the line who are asking, how do I figure out um, kind of what, what the benchmark I need to be meeting is? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think there's multiple ways and levels, you know, which that occurs from your, you know, your local competitors in your market today to, you know, other organizations that maybe are more non-traditional, as I mentioned earlier, that might come into your market, depending on where you're geographically located, might already be in your market if you're in a large, you know, metropolitan city. Um, the one medicals, so some of those organizations are doing some really cool, you know, innovative stuff. And so at the most basic level, of course, I always tell, you know, whether it's our providers, even our administrators, um, go be a patient or pretend to be at least in a positive way around what's the experience that I'm getting and are there gaps in that experience today that um, you as an organization wish you didn't have, you know, what's your total true north of where I want the experience or the process to be? If you're not there today, again, what's that gap or variance and how do you work to mitigate um, where those outstanding issues might be? And so for us, you know, we do, I mean, I'll be very open. Um, I don't want to say secret shopping, but of course, you know, clicking online, looking at what our competitors do do, because in a positive way, we want them to be as competitive as, po as possible with us. And we want to hold all of ourselves as, you know, as healthcare providers in our community, to a super duper high standard, no matter where a patient is getting their care. And so, you know, I think in a positive way, we welcome that opportunity to be challenged and be pushed the envelope um, in terms of the experience that we're providing. And so we do utilize and want to make sure that across, again, our, you know, our community, our um, providers that we um, compete, but also collaborate with that we're all providing that same standard for our patients. Um, I think the other piece that we think about as well, I'll just piggyback on that, is we try our best to quantify you know, so what's our expectation? Is our expectation as an organization and based on, you know, market data, our own thoughts and beliefs, that if a patient should be able to go within their smart device and have an appointment with us within 20 seconds, 15 seconds, a minute, a minute and a half, whatever that may look like, um, that we're holding ourselves that standard. And what are our competitors doing in that space as well? You know, I um, I mentioned in my bio, you know, that the eight second kind of thing in terms of, you know, an adult's attention span, which um, I, I think can vary, you know, and it just depends on kind of the platform or where you're working from. But um, we like to think of ourselves, again, as having that, you know, you only have one first impression, right? And sometimes I think it's even less than that in terms of not only do I have one first impression, but if that impression, again, is taking a minute, two minutes to be able to materialize or a patient's waiting for something, then we might have already lost them, right? And so I think we try to think, again, and quantify as much as possible. What's that experience that we want the patient to have? And how do you kind of work backwards from that endpoint of whatever that looks like? to get to today, I'm a patient, I'm on my smart device, I'm registering for an appointment, I had five clicks, and I was registered with the PCP and my appointments also as well, hopefully in a reasonable time frame, and um, some of that back end stuff as well. You know, you mentioned um, templates kind of in your question, Adam, I know I mentioned them as well in my kind of opening. Um, that was a real concern for us as an organization, because as we, you know, we have a very large medical group, just even here in central Iowa, over 500 providers, including, you know, ARNPs, PAs, and course physicians, that we had many different types of appointment time slots in our providers' templates. And so 
The last thing you want to be doing is via this digital process. If you have some providers that have 15 minute appointments, some that have 30, some that have 45, and again, those might vary based on patient acuity or whatnot, um, steering patients to a certain provider or clinic because all their providers have 15 minute appointments. And hey, that patient's now telling all their friends and family, oh my gosh, this provider has a 15 minute appointment. It was so quick. I was able to leave work and get back. And it's, it's just truly amazing. Well, some other providers don't have that. We really try to work our best to standardize that. And so we had as much consistency almost as possible across our medical group. And so not only are we all holding ourselves, providers, our staff, whoever, to that same standard, but also making sure patient or consumer um, behavior is not driven a certain way based on parameters that we set up ourselves, you know, as an organization. So. Excellent. Thanks, Rob. You know, we've talked about uh, Gen Z, um, but I, I think there's a lot of various, you know, kind of variables that are, that have changed patient expectations over the years. Can you talk about, at least in your market, um, how patient expectations have changed over the last few years? Maybe it's COVID, maybe it's, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, aging population. Um, how have you seen expectations change? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will touch on COVID um, for a minute. And I, I, I you know, in a, in a positive way, knock on wood, you know, we're obviously moving in the right direction and as a, as a nation and, and, and all that good stuff. But um, I do want to bring that up because it brought us to a very interesting kind of timeline and time frame for us, because if you think, you know, four or five years ago was really our beginning of our journey with our digital front door um, and COVID really starting, you know, the beginning kind of, of you know, 2020, at least here in America, um, you know, we were just kind of right at the beginning or sort of, you know, early integration phases, um, more so really on the outpatient side in our clinics, and our ambulatory settings um, with Freesia. And so when COVID then did hit, we realized very quickly how many actual physical touch points um, we have within our hospital, within our organization excuse me, and worked very quickly to say, so for patients that need immersion care, even outpatient care in our hospital, how do we kind of work very quickly to have a process in place that patients can utilize that's digital, um, but also still receive that care at the time they need it in person as well. And so um, right in the beginning of 2020, we worked very quickly again with Freesia, with you guys, Adam, um, to develop something uh, for our EDs in, in central Iowa. And that's where we really started saying, you know, I'm a patient coming in today. This is again at the height of, of course, masking and, and folks, you know, utilizing quite a large quantity of hand sanitizer, not wanting to touch everything. And so we said, you know, we have our tablets, even in our clinics for registration with Freesia. Can there just be a way again, via a patient's own smart device that they can quickly register, quickly get in line and get care they need without having to go through all the normal touch points that um, many health systems have previously had, some still have, of course, today. And we were able to, again, get that up and running in a very short period of time. But that's the other piece I guess I would um, just harp or hone in on in a positive way very quickly is that um, with Freesia, with just digital platforms in general, um, the speed to market and access was something that we learned right away in a very impressive way is much different than the traditional I'm integrating something with my large health system or my provider and would take process and regulatory and other things. And not to say that we didn't go through some of those steps with our Freesia integration, um, but just in terms of the, the software and, and the quick ease to use and getting it from, okay, here's what we need. Here's the vision to a patient actually going through the process on their smart device themselves. Um, very, very nimble and very impressive from the Freesia perspective. And so allowed us again, especially in the pandemic at a time of, you know, heightened, you know, security to get something up and running very, very quickly. Um, and Freesia being very flexible to work with us and to trial and, and make sure that we felt very comfortable with the product and process before it just became, you know, into the market here. So um, I hope I answered your question. Any other follow-ups on that, Adam, or anything else from the chat on that piece or? No, that was great. Uh, it, it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I think the other thing that is important to think about, we're talking a lot about what people expect. Um, and that can go for new patients and, uh, you know, current patients that we run our train, right? So I want to break these down. We've got acquisition, we've got retention. Let's start with acquisition. Um, you know, I think uh, you could talk about providing the experience that people expect so that they want to come to your health system, but but how else do you use your digital front door to actually acquire patients, to actively get out there and get patients, um, you know, when competing with other health systems or simply yeah. getting people to take action for their health? Absolutely. Um, you know, just through our own digital content um, marketing, we try to make sure that the links, the places that patients may go who are, you know, thinking about, you know, Maybe not even changing provider, but just getting established with a provider. Maybe somebody again to your, one of your earlier slides who's you know not actively seeking healthcare, but would like to perhaps if they had the right opportunity or avenue. 
or something click they could just you know quick quickly click on and and, and get to where they want to be. Um, we try to make sure that digitally we are positioned as an organization to be at those places, whether it's online, wherever that you know the right medium or avenue is, that patients would say, okay, I you know I just I do maybe need that or I'd be interested in learning more about that. So how can I do that quickly and easily? And oh by the way, you can make an appointment with us, no questions asked at just clicking this link and going through a couple of very just quick, you know, data points on your personal history. And for the most part, we found that patients actually like that because they, of course, want us to know about them to a certain degree, right, before we maybe have that intimate relationship established between the patient and provider of, you know, their background, their data, data, birth, data birth, or maybe even other things they're just thinking about in terms of, okay, you know, I really do need to establish the primary care provider, but I am kind of concerned about this or just thinking about that. I'd like to even just learn more from an educational perspective about that and anything we can glean you know, from our patients so that we can make that experience just truly remarkable once they do, you know, physically or digitally present to us as a, as a patient, um, I think just goes a long way in, again, establishing that connection, right? Because you mentioned sticky earlier, you know, we want to find some kind of middle ground between, you know, not necessarily being post-it note, right? But, and not necessarily being that adhesive that you literally, you know, can't get yourself unstuck from, but somewhere, you know, on that path or timeline of, you know, I am as a patient, really feel that I have that deep developed connection with my provider, with the health system. And, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, it really does start, I think, with that provider and this, and maybe the staff as well from a location or whatever the patient is established at to really make sure they feel that they have, again, what they need. Um, their questions are answered in a timely format and fashion. We talk about, you know, wanting providers to answer questions digitally, um, through a provider portal, things of that nature. I mean, we even today, I'll openly admit in a positive way, have some providers that, you know, are open to texting. I mean, things of that nature. I mean, we really have tried to break down as many barriers as possible. And so patients can really get what they feel they need um, from their provider, because that's for better or worse, the standard that I believe we're all held to, right? I mean, if you think about whether you're in healthcare or not, or just the platform you're in, um, we all have, a, I mean, the most timely communication that we've ever had in our, you know, our organization's history, our, the history of ourselves as a nation, you know, with, I mean, texting and all other types of avenues. And so we just try to make, really make sure that we're at where the patient is in terms of acquisition, in terms of what they're looking for. And then again, make the process as non-daunting, as simple as possible, and just get them in the door. And then we believe from that point on, of course, like most organizations do, that we have the providers, the people, the personnel, the processes in place that once we, you know, get them at least somewhat intrigued that we can hopefully develop that relationship. So um, they view us as their provider of choice down the road in their lives as well. That's fantastic. Yeah, Rob, I, I think part of it too, by the way, is providers that we're talking about clinical, you know, clinicians, clinicians not always going to be available. If we're doing our jobs right, their schedules are, are going to be full and they're going to be productive. But having a dedicated person to make sure that someone is communicating the, with the patient, that someone's available to the patient in a timely manner, is really important and that we're doing it in a way that is easy for them to, to access in, in technologies that they already use. Like you said, like texting, uh, you know, uh, with the right, of course, with the right privacy precautions. So um, yeah, fantastic. It, that's acquisition. Let's talk about retention. Rob, what advice do you have for using digital tools to make patients stick? How do we make that relationship sticky and build trust and loyalty once we've had them in? You said the processes, the people, Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, you know, I think for us, the main point, I guess I would just, I wouldn't make there is being proactive on the provider side, right? Because patients, you know, for the most part, you know, have an idea, I need an annual checkup, right? You know, I, I there's probably some ongoing services I need. And obviously based on the patient's age, if they fall into a certain age bracket, they might need, you know, certain imaging, or we talked about mammograms or things like that. But for us as the provider digitally, we need to be the ones that are helping I hate to use the word dictate, but maybe more so guiding that patient's care, right? Because in, in a perfect world, which we've tried to really, you know, work towards, we are taking the onus off of the patient to have to remember, oh my God, my appointments and what I need. And when did I, when I had my last visit, was that three months ago or six months ago? And say, no, via, again, secure text or email or their platform is, here's, again, based on our information, what we have of you as a patient and et cetera, et cetera, here's kind of, you know, your cadre of services we think that you might be interested, again, might be interested in utilizing, you know, down the path or down the road. And how can we best make the process so simple that all you have to do is click here, here, and here, or even less, yeah. 
and be scheduled for that, and then continuously be receiving care from us, right? So um, once we have you in the door, once we have at least that initial visitor relationship established with you, again, it's we really view it as how do we as the health system take that off of you as the patient's, you know, hands in terms of having to, again, you know, juggle all that, because again, people are busy. I mean, I mean, life can be very hectic in a positive way. I mean, humans are amazing and do amazing things every day. And so how do we make at least your healthcare, which is very important, as simple as possible. So you don't feel, you know, the oversome or the onerous burdensome, you know, feeling of, oh my gosh, how do I, you know, manage all this? And how do we best um, partner really with the patient, you know, in that, right? So that's our, um, our belief, and at least what we're aiming for on a daily basis. Yeah, I mean, redoing consents and and making sure that allergies and and drug things haven't changed is really important. I'm never going to (laughs) say that we shouldn't ask that every time, but there's really no other industry where we hand somebody a clipboard that we handed them, you know, a month ago and say, tell us all of this again, you know, Um, you know, you got to at least pre-fill it with what you know, and then give the patient to update it again, right? I mean, uh, that that, that's... Yeah, hundred percent. And I think for better or worse, again, I, you know, I mentioned Amazon earlier, and just mentioning some some organizations that have, have really, you know, made things very simple. As I guess the theme I'm going for, when a patient is sitting there, you know, if they are with a clipboard, which, um, you know, I think we all cringe a little bit inside of that process of, you know, filling out multiple forms and writing your birth date, your name, and your allergies. Yeah. It, you know, why am I doing this? Because I think the first thing that patient or many patients think of are other, again, even outside of healthcare. You know, I'll mention Instagram or other other places where there's digital advertising online and, and, can, and those organizations and, and even advertisers or other uh, entities that advertise on those platforms have done such a good job of, to the T, figuring out their target audience and getting that information, those products to them, that you're almost sitting there scrolling through something or on your phone or thinking and saying, how did they know that I was interested in that? But yeah. I am interested in that and I want to learn more about it. And so when you sit there and think about that level of artificial intelligence or just algorithm kind of working and, and th- fall through all the way to me sitting there on a clipboard writing something, I think people have a hard time conceptualizing that. And then on top of that, in, in a positive way, our health systems, our providers, our clinics, we have, I mean, some of the smartest people in the world, you know, taking care of the human being and the health physically and emotionally. And so they think, if, you know, somewhere where I can go online and buy, you know, moist towelettes or paper, you know, but buy, buy very simple, but very needed products, how come my healthcare provider can't do the same thing? So I think it's unfortunately for better or worse, that's the level that we're really held against, yep. fairly, fairly or not fairly, depending how you look at it. Um, but regardless, perception is reality for a lot of folks. And so it's how do we hold ourselves to that same standard and make sure patients view us on that same level if possible um, in terms of just getting what they need, where they need it, when they need it, and really how digitally or whatever they want to utilize it. Well, and, and Rob, we're talking generally, but you you oversee pediatric care, you know, uh, service lines. And and I mean, it's a whole nother thing to do all these things with a child in tow. You know, it's, it's, it's a horrible experience to, to have to go through paper and mind your child at the same time, especially when they're sick. Well, absolutely. And, you know, um, I can speak to personal and professional experience. You know, I'm, I'm um, a new father as of less than a year ago. And so um, just, you know, juggling, I mean, literally physically, your kids doing things on your, I mean, you know, it's very physically and emotionally and in a positive way, you know, demanding. And so um, I think, you know, if you go through that same sort of guise of an ideal world, right, you know, a family, um, maybe with parents and with kids, no matter the number of, of, of either or, um, liking, you know, to utilize as much as possible services at one, you know, organization provider just to make things simple and save steps and trips and things like that. Um, we have to as best we can you know, curtail our experience to all types of consumers. Again, whether it's a parent for their kid as the patient, whether it's for the, that parent as the patient themselves, right? And so um, I think especially for pediatric healthcare, it just becomes so supreme because, you know, parents are very, very busy. Um, and as much as we can marry again, the experience for them as the consumer for their child that maybe needs healthcare, um, you know, that that's at the forefront of our work and, and something that we do And all of our peds clinics utilize Freesia. And so we're um, really trying to, again, make sure that parents feel that we are, again, that easy provider that they can use. So just quickly click, click, click and set up their kids visit or if their kid needs something, um, you know, that they can quickly utilize that from their provider. Um, just however we can best kind of serve them as well. So, um, yeah, it's been huge for us in all aspects of, I mean, again, from, from kids all the way up through um, our geriatric patients. I mean, you know, the tools are there um, if folks want to utilize them. So Yeah, excellent. Rob, you know, we talk about um, the fact that we are trying to get people uh, to stick 
Um, I'm wondering, have you observed these kinds of tools? Um, you know, when you when you bolster that digital front door, are you observing that your providers are seeing your clinicians are seeing more patients in any given day? Or are you seeing less no shows? Yeah, um, I'll I'll address both those. Maybe no shows first. Um, we have seen remarkable improvement in terms of it decreasing our, our no show rate. And so um, prior to having this digitally connected experience, you know, we have patients call in for their appointments and it was honestly really hit or miss. I mean, not for obviously everybody, but um, depending on the patient or the population, if those individuals were going to show up. And we have just even found um, in talking to patients as well, if they make their appointments digitally saying, you know, I was able to do this all on my phone. And then I just quickly was able to either make a calendar appointment or get a reminder sent to me via text um, that I was having this appointment upcoming. Um, and we even have married that, of course, with our, our co-payments and digital payment processes, which we can get we can get to, you know, um, if folks have questions or, or whatnot. But um, more importantly, we're, again, able to digitally interact with those patients, again, a day or two, whatever the right timeline is before their appointment. So, again, they're being reminded of it, registering for it, and really knocking out most of, again, that kind of paper and clipboard process we've historically talked about on their own time prior to even coming and seeing us. And so it becomes as simple as them then just walking in the door or even digitally if they're seeing a provider digitally and almost immediately being seen. I mean, just laying in person that, you know, front desk individual know they're there. But after that, they're right in the room. I mean, they are right in the room seeing a provider or seeing a staff a member or nurse or what have you to get some information. And um, it's all done. And so I think that's been really huge for us um, in terms of that aspect. What was the second part of your question? I apologize. I want to make oh, sure. ju- no, 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 no. It's just, just around the idea of, uh, we talked about no shows. Oh, yeah, about just being, yeah, absolutely. yeah, volume. Yeah. Yeah. So we um, have actually, we feel in the data shows it's seen more patients, whether you look at it on per, per provider basis, per clinic, where a medical, entire medical group basis um, by having a digital process and platform for scheduling, because you know, we've essentially opened our provider temples, as we talked about earlier, allowed patients to directly insert themselves in time blocks that we again establish and have just made it much more easy for our patients to just honestly access our services. And so we have seen our providers um, be able to increase the number of patients they see per day if they so desire. Um, And just the overall organizations, just huge increases in that regard, because in a positive way, we've totally eliminated the patient having to call or use some other methodology where they're waiting, right? It's that it's that waiting piece that just kills us. And so, you know, historically, a lot of healthcare institutions have talked about, you know, how do you minimize waiting and how do you even make it seem like patients aren't waiting for so long if they, if they do have to, unfortunately, for whatever reason, wait for something. We've just taken the approach in the best way possible. Let's just eliminate it. I mean, seriously, let's eliminate it. So like, again, to the point where you've already done a lot of the digital stuff prior to even coming and seeing us in person, eliminate the waiting. I mean, we still have waiting rooms, but eliminate, just come in and go f- right into a room. I mean, that's, you know, when, when patients are not patients and they're, you know, in society utilizing other services and things, I mean, a lot of different types of industries and places they go. I mean, again, they go in and they go right to where they need to be to get what they need. So um, that's our ultimate, again, goal. And we're, it's, we're not perfect and no one is, but we're, you know, actively working to continuously improve and get to that point. And um, I think we feel our patients have been appreciative, hopefully, of that. And um, we've seen some of that with our volumes in a positive way. So I, th- I think it just helped us across the board. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's like we talk about when people uh, have paid, especially when they've paid, but when they've registered beforehand, when they've taken the time to think through everything before their visit, there's some kind of social compact that that, that has caused them to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to show up now because I've, done, I've put in the time. Uh, and, and frankly, they're, they come more prepared. So that's great. Rob, I want to ask you one more question, just some parting thoughts if you have them. Um, for healthcare organizations uh, that are seeking to go through a significant digital transformation like Mercy One did, uh, I mean, we're all on an ongoing journey, but wh- where do you think you start? What do you prioritize? How do you m- chart that journey? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the first area I, I really think is, again, you know, this in a positive way is really all about the patient experience um, and their experience, again, whether it's, you know, via payments, scheduling, just their experience with your organization. And so, we started, you know, at the patient and for others who are thinking about, you know, we don't have this today or how do we kind of start thinking about this in a more digital or, um, you know, whatever format, I would start at where the patient is 
and really process map out whether you're, whether it's with your process improvement people or, or whoever is in a similar type of role that would help in terms of understanding just a process, the steps that are part of it. And really, I would also say getting a multidisciplinary team together, whether that includes clinical staff, physicians, I mean, the full gamut. I mean, one of the things we did off the bat is we start at the patient. Then we involved all the different types of caregivers, including, I mean, folks who are financial counselors, I mean, front desk individual, I mean, the full gamut of saying, here's the current process we have today. What are the pain points? What are the things that we feel could be more efficient or would be better for the patient? Here's what we're thinking about doing, or if we had a digital process, what this would look like and help us map and create that. So it's, again, the best possible process for the patient, for the physician, for everybody who's included in that patient's care journey, right? Because- um, you know, I think we think about in terms of the holistic approach of all the care providers, of all the people clinical and not that are part of that patient's care, and how do we develop something that fits everybody's needs in, in the best way possible, right? And so, again, I would go back to the patient of how they interact with their system today, and what's that optimal process or solution that you feel um, would be where you want to go, and then honestly, just work backwards from that optimal state of how are you going to actually make that a reality, so that I'm a patient. And I can make an appointment or I can interact with your system or I can do whatever you want me to do as quickly and as easy as possible to the point where, um, you know, I just feel very satisfied with the service, you know, that I'm getting. Rob, uh, we could talk about this for a whole nother hour, I think, uh, but <laughs> that's all the time we have for today. Rob, thank you so much uh, for such an awesome uh, presentation. Thanks for sharing uh, just all the great things that are happening at Mercy One. It was really great to talk to you. Audience, if we didn't get to your question in the chat, or if you have any questions about Freesia uh, or Mercy One, please don't hesitate to request a consultation using the form on the right-hand side of your screen. We'd love to be in touch. Again, thanks, Rob, for joining us. Uh, thanks to our audience for, for joining us today. Uh, and don't forget, if you're, uh, you can go ahead and use that consultation form. Um, and you can also email Tamara Thompson, uh, T. Thompson at Freesia.com. We'll be in touch. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much, Rob. Hey, thank you guys so much. And um, again, just wanted to thank everybody who was part of this today. And, um, you know, if folks ever want to get in touch with me, I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me. I'm, you know, um, in the community and just um, really excited to be part of this work. And again, can't thank Freesia enough and our organization for um, partnering together to make this reality for our patients. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much.